thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope, orbiting the Sun at a distance of 1 million miles away from our planet, we can see dozens of young quasars in the first billion years of the universe. Quasars are active galactic nuclei, extremely bright cores of galaxies. There, dust and gas fall into a supermassive black hole, emitting electromagnetic radiation across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. This gas and dust become immensely luminous because of the extreme friction and gravity they experience when being pulled into the black hole. It's no wonder that quasars are among the brightest objects in the universe that we know about. They typically emit thousands of times more light than our entire home galaxy, the Milky Way. They're also located at enormous distances from Earth. The speed of light is finite, and objects we observe from Earth are seen as they used to be when the light we now see left them. Quasars nearest to Earth sit a few hundred million light years away. And currently, we can only see them as they were 600 million years ago. The fact that there are no quasars closer to our planet doesn't mean there have never been any of these extreme space objects in our region of the universe. Instead, it means that quasars existed when the universe was way younger. Now, inside almost every galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole. Within its event horizon, millions and even billions of solar masses are locked in space-time. Supermassive black holes power ultra-bright quasars, encourage star formation, and sometimes change the evolution of galaxies. Based on their size and abundance, we can conclude that supermassive black holes could have formed rather early in cosmic history. But how early are we talking about? It's still unclear, and that's what one of the recent studies has been trying to figure out. The team behind this research is focused on distant quasars. How bright a black hole is partly depends on its size. This connection can be used to estimate the mass of early supermassive black holes. The scientists decided to concentrate on the most distant quasars that seem quite faint to us. After conducting a few surveys, the researchers identified 350 compact galaxies. The light from these galaxies began its journey toward Earth when the universe was less than a billion years old, which places the galaxies among the earliest ones out there. Out of these hundreds of galaxies, 64 likely have quasars. It means the presence of active, supermassive black holes at their centers. The team then compared the brightness and redshift to calculate the age and mass of these black holes. And even though a sample of 64 galaxies doesn't seem to be large, it was enough for the scientists to apply special simulations to figure out how these black holes evolved. They discovered that statistically, these early supermassive black holes were huge compared to their home galaxies they had a mass of up to 10 million solar masses. This conclusion might suggest that black holes form early when their galaxies are small and later when their galaxies are larger and more evolved. This theory supports the direct collapse model of the formation of supermassive black holes rather than the idea that they grow in mass when smaller black holes merge together. Admittedly, there's a bit of observation bias in the data received by the researchers, mostly because of the limits of observation. After all, we're more likely to see the brightest and most massive early black holes. And while the study might prove that some early supermassive black holes appeared after direct collapse, it doesn't mean all of them did. Hopefully, we're going to have more deep sky surveys in the near future, and there will surely be more data to use to study early black holes. At the moment, we know about dozens of early supermassive black holes. Once this number grows to hundreds, we might be able to understand the different origins of galactic black holes. To see one of the most significant astronomical events of all time, we go to South America. In the Atacama Desert, Chile, we find the most advanced technology for space observation. Here, the Royal Astronomical Community members watched for six months as a black hole simply absorbed a massive star. By the way, these are the same scientists who prove that in the center of our Milky Way galaxy is a supermassive black hole, and even took a photo of it. For the first time in history, this incredible event happened very close to Earth. Well, 
the distance of 215 million light years is considered quite close in astronomy terms anyway. Light from this event reached our planet in September of 2019, and even the most experienced scientists dropped their jaws in surprise. Imagine a star the size of our Sun, about 860,000 miles wide. Such stars have enough weight to create a strong gravitational field, holding many planets in their orbit. And now, let's place a giant black hole next to it. The hole is absolutely black, shaped like a disk, and weighs a billion times more than this star. The force of its gravitational field is incredible. Nothing can leave its gravity force. Objects that can move at the speed of light will still fall into this black abyss. Even light itself cannot escape its boundaries. As soon as a star enters the gravitational field of a black hole, it has no chance. At first, it tries to resist the pull of the black hole. Still, the star's outer layers begin to stretch toward the black hole, just like spaghetti. This is due to a powerful force of attraction. If you had the opportunity to extend your hand toward the black hole, hmm. you would see your fingers begin to stretch and elongate. This is because the force of attraction increases with every inch. Therefore, it acts stronger on your fingers than on your arm. That's why this process of pulling objects into a black hole is called spaghettification. The first thing to be sucked into the black hole is the star's crown. This is the outer shell of the star, which consists of hot plasma. You may notice how the star begins to shrink in size. This is because that plasma makes up most of the visible sun. When this hot plasma spaghetti reaches the black hole, it may appear to remain on the disk's edge and continue to orbit the black hole. But in fact, there is no turning back anymore. The star's particles have already hit the event horizon of the dark abyss. The gravitational field of a black hole bends light around its edges, so the event horizon looks a bit like a croissant for the observer. Boy, lots of food metaphors here. I'm getting hungry. You may also notice a kind of chaos in this ring, as if some light particles are moving in one direction and others in another. This happens because of a mirror effect. But you can be sure that whatever reaches the event horizon will, sooner or later, be pulled into the singularity, or the black pearl of the black hole. Another illusion you spot is the star particles in the event horizon moving slower. The truth is that supermassive objects like a black hole curve space-time around them. And the more massive the object, the slower time flows near it. If you hang one watch beside a black hole and another on a wall in your bedroom, you will see that the second hand in the first watch barely moves, while a whole day passes on Earth. As observers, it seems to us that the particles of light have slowed their movement. But in fact, they may have already been absorbed by the black hole ages ago. Now, massive streams of red-hot plasma splash into space, just like spaghetti sauce. <laughs> when a black hole has absorbed star material, it emits powerful rays of energy at a rate of about 6,200 miles per second. This release of energy is accompanied by an intense flash. It's thanks to this flash that scientists can even detect this process in the first place. This phenomenon can be observed when a supernova explodes. When nothing remains of the star's body, we can still see stardust and other particles in the black hole's event horizon. Kind of like the Parmesan cheese sprinkled on the spaghetti. Hey, stop me if I'm taking this too far. When the process of spaghettification is completed, about half of the star's weight has been thrown into outer space as dust and glowing particles. The other half was entirely absorbed by the black hole. The scientists observed this process for almost six months. But what would be more interesting is to dive into a black hole yourself. Well. We can't do that yet, but we can simulate this process. Here's a little drone, our metal friend. Kind of like a meatball. No, I haven't had lunch yet. Right now, it's at a safe distance from the black hole, the length of about three widths of the event horizon. Objects at this distance can orbit the black hole safely. A little closer, and it'll be swallowed up by a dark infinity. So our destroyed star could have safely existed at this distance. 
Moreover, planets can live at this distance. And if there is a suitable source of light and heat somewhere nearby, life can exist on these planets too. But our goal is the singularity, and we guide the meatball, I mean the drone, closer to the event horizon. After a few minutes, the force of attraction begins to strengthen, and the drone starts to stretch like spaghetti. When it begins spinning around the black disk, it means it has reached the event horizon and has started its descent into the black abyss. Now, let's look at everything from the drone's perspective. All the light from the stars that it sees becomes blue. This is called gravitational blue shift. As it falls into the black hole, its gravitational field pulls the photons of light down, giving them energy. Their wavelengths grow shorter, so the red photons change into blue. The drone continues to fall and is already completely hidden from our eyes. And all that the robot sees is a bright, thin blue beam. Now it's in complete darkness. There's absolutely nothing here, not even time. Here, time goes so slowly that our entire solar system could grow old and cease to exist during a minute spent in a black hole. But our drone will live until its battery is empty. Hey, the drone sees a small bundle of light again, and it's getting closer and more prominent. Now the drone will experience the same fall, only in reverse. Once the drone leaves the singularity, the heart of the black hole, it will be on the event horizon once again. The light from the stars gradually changes from blue to red. Then the drone is thrown into outer space, perhaps in some faraway galaxy. Well, returning from a black hole is just a theory. Some people think that black holes are a kind of wormhole that can lead us to distant places in space. But so far, these theories are considered fiction. Black holes are quite challenging to detect. The problem is, they are, well, black, just like space. They don't emit light like stars, so they can only be detected by gravity anomalies. Despite this, scientists believe there are a vast numbers of black holes in our universe. They're born when a massive star collapses under its own weight. And given the infinite number of stars in the universe, black holes are probably a common phenomenon. Scientists believe black holes have their own lifetimes. This is because of Hawking radiation. A black hole loses mass, and so, to continue existing, it has to absorb massive objects, like the star we just watched. But if the black hole lives in deep space, it has less to absorb and will most likely begin to shrink until it just disappears. Like this plate of spaghetti. Mm. Recently, the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted something no one expected to see. It might be a new kind of star that was born in the early universe. And the most shocking thing about this star is that it's likely to be powered by dark matter. The thing is, around 84% of matter in the universe doesn't emit or absorb light. Astronomers call this stuff, which can neither be seen directly nor detected by indirect means, dark matter. It supposedly affects visible matter, radiation, and the very structure of the universe. These days, we have several detectors looking for weakly interacting massive particles. That's what dark matter might be composed of. But so far, researchers have found nothing of the kind. One of the most recent studies claims that dark matter might produce long, fine-grained streams radiating out from Earth like hairs and streaming throughout the universe. But it hasn't been proven yet. Now, returning to dark stars that might be powered by this mysterious dark matter. The very concept of such stars still remains hypothetical. Astronomers aren't sure that the images received by James Webb show exactly them. But even if one of the three candidates spotted by scientists turns out to be this new kind of star, it could offer us a glimpse of how stars formed in the early universe. Plus, we would probably be able to find out something new about dark matter and even explain how supermassive black holes appeared out there. The first time someone mentioned the term dark star was in 2007. These space objects could have been some of the first types of stars to form in the universe. They haven't been observed yet. But astronomers think they might be powered by heat that is generated during dark matter interactions rather than by nuclear fusion reactions, like it happens with our sun. Experts believe dark stars would probably look extremely weird. 
they could have appeared from clouds of hydrogen and helium that drew in excess dark matter. We still don't know the nature of dark matter. But there's a theory that particles of dark matter might be able to interact with themselves, annihilating one another during collisions, and, thus, producing huge amounts of light and heat. Then, this heat could have prevented the cloud of hydrogen and helium from condensing. It means these gases wouldn't have been able to create dense, hot cores similar to those the stars existing today have. And if this gas cloud wouldn't have condensed, dark stars could have grown to truly enormous size. In theory, a dark star could be around 10 times as wide as our planet's orbit around the sun. Imagine the sheer size of such a space monster. These stars would also be millions of times as massive as our star, and their light could be billions of times brighter. It might be the reason why James Webb managed to spot them. To check for dark stars that might be lurking out there, scientists thoroughly examined the images from a JWDUSP survey of early galaxies. They spotted more than 700 objects that could have appeared in the first 100 million years after the universe appeared. That's exactly the time when dark stars were probably born. Light from objects that appeared so unimaginably long ago is stretched, or, as astronomers call it, redshifted. So, the team examining the images picked four objects that had already been confirmed to be extremely redshifted. It meant that the researchers were looking at some of the oldest space objects observed so far. These objects might be tiny galaxies from the times when our universe was just a baby. Unfortunately, since they're so far away, the resolution of James Webb isn't enough to figure out whether they're indeed galaxies or just large super bright stars. It was the year 2017 when astronomers spotted a bright star hurtling out of the Milky Way. It was moving incredibly fast at a speed of 2 million miles per hour. That's almost four times as fast as the Sun orbits around the center of our home Milky Way galaxy. It takes our star more than 225 million years to complete one journey. Anyway, back to our star, the Wanderer. The main issue with it was that it was moving against the direction in which most stars travel around the center of our galaxy. Even more bizarre, it consisted of totally different star stuff. Astronomers managed to identify its composition. The star was made up of heavy metallic atoms. At the same time, most of the other stars consist of way lighter elements. The wandering star got the name LP40365. It was moving so fast that it literally dashed out of our galaxy. This made scientists believe that the space traveler was pushed out of its place by some kind of cosmic disaster, like a supernova. A supernova is the largest explosion that can take place in space, an explosion of a star. It happens after irreversible changes start in the core of a star. Supernovas can occur in two ways, in binary star systems and when there's a single star. Binary stars are two stars orbiting around the same center. At some moment, one of the stars, a very dense white dwarf, starts stealing matter from its companion. After some time, this thief accumulates too much matter, which causes it to explode into a supernova. Or it can be a single star nearing the end of its life. It's running out of its fuel. More and more mass is flowing into the core of the star, in the end, the core becomes so heavy that it fails to withstand its own gravity. After the core collapses, a tremendous amount of energy is released in a supernova. But astronomers still can't figure out how a supernova could send LP40365 flying. There are more questions than answers. Was it a companion star that got flung out by a shockwave created by a supernova? Or was it a piece of the exploded star? A new study based on the collected data has shown that the star, which is a white dwarf, keeps slowly rotating around its axis. Astronomers are almost sure it means LP40365 is indeed just a chunk of space debris and not a full-fledged star. This wandering piece somehow managed to survive one of the fiercest space events. But after making such a conclusion, scientists realize something amazing. LP40365's unusual features could appear after the star witnessed a supernova. Even though this event happened lightning fast, the entire makeup of the star got changed. 
Most stars consist mainly of helium and hydrogen, but LP4365 is different. It contains such heavy elements as magnesium, oxygen, and neon. It must have been the supernova that added these atoms to the star's composition. By the way, astronomers consider all elements that are heavier than helium to be metals. This means that after witnessing the supernova, LP4365 became metallic. Right now, the star doesn't have its own planets, but NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is on the lookout for distant planets passing in front of their host stars and dimming them, has noticed a curious thing. LP4365 brightens and then dims again every 8.9 hours. It might mean that the star pulsates, but usually stellar pulsations are much less regular. A more plausible explanation is that the star's surface is uneven. And as it spins, sunspots are brought into and out of view. And it's great news, because after astronomers figure out how fast the star rotates, they can understand what happened to it around 5 million years ago during the supernova. Bright blue exoplanet HD 189733b looks peaceful and eerily familiar. Doesn't it resemble Earth? But this appearance conceals the planet's terrifying nature. There, the winds blow at 5,400 miles per hour. It's seven times the speed of sound. But that's not the worst. It rains glass, sideways, in this scorching, hot world. Neutron stars are ultra-dense collapsed cores of giant stars. They emit X-rays or radio waves. But in 2018, astronomers discovered a weird stream of infrared light. It seemed to be coming from a neutron star 800 light-years away from our planet. The most plausible theory is that this signal was probably produced by a disk of dust surrounding the star. But there isn't enough evidence to confirm this idea. Mercury is the fastest planet in the solar system. It zips around the sun at a breakneck speed of more than 100,000 miles per hour. That's around 40,000 miles per hour faster than our home planet. It's one of the reasons why a year on Mercury equals 88 days on Earth. Mercury is the planet that orbits the closest to the Sun. That's why if you were standing on its surface at its closest approach to our star, the Sun would look more than three times as large as it does on Earth. The Black Widow Pulsar is a rotating neutron star that is munching on its partner, which is a lightweight brown dwarf star. The more material the pulsar consumes, the more slowly it spins. The energy the neutron star is losing in the process causes the companion star to dwindle. There's a stellar nursery in the constellation Centaurus, and even though this place is called a nursery, it's anything but peaceful or safe. It's made up of hydrogen and newborn stars and is located in a nebula around 6,500 light-years away from Earth. A nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust floating in space. The intense energy baby stars emit makes hydrogen clouds glow ominous red. This energy is so powerful, it's eating away dark clouds of dust. Astronomers can see them disappear like lumps of butter on a hot frying pan. Faraway Neptune-sized exoplanet Gliese 436b is a paradox. It's made of scorching hot ice, and this ice is burning. The planet completes one full orbit around the red dwarf Gliese 436 in just two days. It means the exoplanet travels very close to its parent star. That might be the reason why the planet's temperatures rarely drop below 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But the strangest thing? The planet hosts huge volumes of water ice known as Ice X. And this ice remains solid despite such incredibly high temperatures. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It's 318 times as massive as Earth. It's also two and a half times as massive as all other planets of the solar system combined. But here's a paradox. If this gas giant got even more massive, it'd actually become smaller. The added mass would make the planet denser, and this would cause it to start pulling in on itself. Astronomers claim that Jupiter can eventually end up being four times as massive as it is now. But at the same time, its size won't change. DGSAT1 galaxy is as big as the Milky Way, but it's nearly invisible because its stars are spread out incredibly thin. 
But what makes the galaxy so unique is that it's sitting all alone, unlike other galaxies of this kind. Those are usually found in clusters. It can mean that DGSAT1 was formed in a different era, probably a mere 1 billion years after the Big Bang. If it's true, the galaxy is a real living fossil. Saturn's moon, Hyperion, is one of the most bizarre-looking moons in the solar system. But the appearance isn't the strangest thing about this space body. The pumice stone-like rock is pockmarked with countless craters, and it's also charged with static electricity, which is flowing out into space. About 4,000 light-years away from Earth, there's a planet that seems to be one enormous diamond. The planet is denser than any other discovered so far and consists mostly of carbon. It's so dense that astronomers think this carbon might be crystalline. It means that at least some part of the planet is diamond. Ceres is the most massive space body in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. It totals almost a third of the entire mass of the whole belt. But at the same time, Ceres is the tiniest of the dwarf planets out there. It's also the only dwarf planet that dwells in the asteroid belt, and also the only one that is located in the inner solar system. Astronomers sometimes call Jupiter a failed star. The gas giant indeed contains a lot of helium and hydrogen. But its mass isn't enough to start a fusion reaction in its core. And that's exactly how stars produce energy. They fuse the atoms of hydrogen together under extreme pressure and heat and create helium. In the process, they also release light and heat. Jupiter could start a nuclear reaction and become a star only if it was 70 times its current mass. Space is completely, eerily silent. That's because in the vacuum of space, there's no atmosphere, and the sound waves need some medium to travel through. That's why worlds with atmospheres like Earth are full of noise. Unlike their massive siblings, hypothetical mini black holes could be really tiny, not bigger than an atom. Even so, just one minuscule thing would have enough mass of a thousand sedans. One theory claims that tons of micro black holes could be created right after the Big Bang. Some scientists even go so far as to say that a couple of mini black holes pass through our planet every day. Every hour, the Sun sends more energy to Earth than our planet uses in a year. Even though people are now using much more solar energy than a decade ago, it's still a mere 0.7% of the world's annual electricity usage. There might be moons orbiting other moons, but astronomers haven't agreed on this theory yet. Planets orbit stars, moons orbit planets. But why can't there be moon moons, also known as submoons, moonettes, and moons? Researchers claim that moon moons could exist, but the host moon has to be massive enough and the moon moon small enough. There must also be a large distance between these moons and the host planet. Jupiter is the most massive planet in the solar system. This means its gravity is also the most intense. It's 2.5 times as great as what we have on our home planet. Once, the gas giant's gravity even tore apart a large comet called Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. Then the planet eagerly swallowed the chunks of the former comet. If you were standing at the equator on Mars, the temperature at your feet would feel like that of a warm spring day, but your head would be literally freezing. Lost in space and drifting through galaxies, rogue planets were once flung away from their parent stars, but one of them floating 200 light years away from Earth is different from the rest. It's a planet-sized object with a magnetic field 200 times stronger than that of Jupiter. This field is so powerful that it generates never-ending flashing auroras in the planet's atmosphere. Europa is one of Jupiter's largest moons, even though it's smaller than Earth's moon. But the cool thing about this satellite of the gas giant is that it's covered with ice. And some of this ice is smooth, which means you could skate there. And a three-foot axle jump you can perform on our planet would take you 22 feet into the air. At the same time, the landing speed on Europa would be the same as it is on Earth. Haumea, a dwarf planet orbiting the Kuiper Belt, has a bizarre elongated shape and two moons. The day on this planet lasts four hours, making it the fastest spinning large object in the solar system. 
But the most mysterious thing about Haumea is that the planet has a thin 40-mile-wide ring circling it. Astronomers haven't managed to figure out how or why it appeared around the dwarf planet. Eleven Earths could fit across the equator of Jupiter, and if our planet was the size of a grape, the gas giant would be as large as a basketball. Nine spacecraft have already visited Jupiter. Seven of them just flew by, and two orbited the huge planet. The most recent of them, Juno, arrived at Jupiter in 2016. The craters of the Moon's south pole are likely to be the frostiest place in the whole solar system. The crater's floors are always in the shadow. That's why the temperature never rises above 397 degrees Fahrenheit, even during the day. If you decided to fly a plane to Pluto, your journey would take around 800 years. You'll find the highest mountain in the solar system on an asteroid called Vesta. Its peak rises 14 miles above the base of the mountain. This makes Rye Silvia, that's what the mountain is called, almost three times taller than Everest. Saturn's rings weren't discovered all at once. It happened gradually. That's why they were named alphabetically in the order scientists found them. Now they go like this. D, C, B, A, F, G, and E. A day on Venus is around 243 Earth days long. But the bad news is that you'd have to wait for a weekend for three years. All because a day on Venus is longer than its year. A solar phenomenon called Terminator Events is taking place at the Sun's equator. Disastrous magnetic field collisions seem to cause ginormous twin tsunamis of plasma. These tsunamis tear across the star's surface, moving at a speed of 1,000 feet per second. They can last for weeks at a time and happen almost every decade. The winds on Neptune are the fastest in our solar system. Most of them can reach the speed of 1,600 miles per hour. Almost any of these enormous storms could easily swallow our entire planet. The 18th brightest star in the night sky, Fomalhaut, is a terrifying sight. It's dubbed the Eye of Sauron because a ring of dust and debris circling it makes it look like a giant eye staring into your soul. The intimidating star is more than twice the mass of our Sun and is 25 light years away from Earth, which isn't that far away considering distances in space. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. In the next 30 to 50 million years, the planet's gravitational forces will tear Phobos apart. It'll probably result in the formation of a ring around Mars. An asteroid the size of a car enters the atmosphere of our planet every year. Such an intruder could wipe out a small town off the face of the Earth. Dust and smoke would rise into the atmosphere, preventing sunlight from reaching the surface of the planet. It would cause the temperatures all over the world to drop and the climate would change. Luckily, such asteroids burn in the atmosphere before they even come close to the surface. The radio signal produced by a spacecraft when it contacts Earth is less powerful than a light bulb in your fridge. By the time this signal reaches our planet, its power is only one billionth of one billionth of a watt. No wonder that antennas gathering these super weak signals are huge. The deep space network that detects signals from spacecraft has dish antennas that measure up to 230 feet across. That's more than the width of a soccer field. In 1999, NASA lost a Mars orbiter because one engineering team was using the metric system and another was doing calculations with the help of the imperial system. Nebulas are giant clouds of gas and dust. With time, gravity starts to pull these clumps of dust and gas together. They grow larger and larger and their gravity gets more powerful. One day, a nebula's mass becomes so great that it collapses under its own gravity and forms a new star. Around 4,000 light years away, in the constellation of Scorpion, there is the Butterfly Nebula. Its wingspan is greater than three light years, and the structure inside the nebula is one of the most complicated ever observed. The nebula's central star, a white dwarf, is heated to an insane 450,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This means it was formed from another huge star, likely more than five times the size of our Sun. 
The white dwarf is surrounded by a thick disk of dust and gas at the equator. That's what probably makes the whole structure look like an hourglass or a butterfly. If you decided to lump together all the known asteroids in the solar system, their total mass wouldn't exceed even 10% of the mass of our moon. A cloud of water vapor is floating in space. It surrounds a supermassive black hole 12 billion light years away from Earth. The cloud contains 140 trillion times the entire volume of water on our planet. Astronomers think this water cloud appeared just 1.6 billion years later than the universe itself. The densest objects in space are neutron stars. They are the size of a small city. Yet their mass is about 1.4 times the mass of our sun. A single teaspoon of neutron star material would weigh a billion tons. And a neutron star's gravity is 2 billion times stronger than the gravity of our planet. In 1993, the Galileo probe was traveling past a miniature asteroid. It was no more than 20 miles across. And still, the tiny thing had a one-mile-wide moon. Astronomers have discovered tons of moons orbiting minor planets in the solar system since then. We live inside the Sun. The star's atmosphere stretches way beyond its visible surface, and our planet is well within its reach. That's how the gust of the solar wind creates such a breathtaking phenomenon as the northern and southern lights. OG64 is an incredible red supergiant star sitting in the large Magellanic Cloud satellite galaxy. Look, it's over here, in the southern constellation of Dorado. It's one of the largest stars we know about. It's even sometimes described as the largest star detected by astronomers. It's also unbelievably luminous and massive, which makes this star stand apart from its space siblings. No wonder that it is classified as a red supergiant. Those are the largest stars in the universe in terms of volume, even though they might not be the most massive or luminous. The radius of WOHG64 is estimated to be around 1,540 times that of our Sun, and the luminosity of the cosmic giant is over 282,000 times the solar luminosity. The colossal size of this distant supergiant star challenges the boundaries of stellar dimensions. You see, astronomers are sure that stars can't grow indefinitely. Neither can they survive once they gain too much weight, and too much refers to around 150 solar masses. All because the enormous radiation pressure and mass loss from the star are likely to disrupt its gravitational stability. At the same time, more massive stars have been discovered, like the 265 solar mass star R13601. At the same time, such stars most likely form by the merger of two or even more stars. But as we already know, mass and physical size are not closely related, especially when we talk about giant stars. That's why such space behemoths as WOH G64 exist. The reach of this giant star extends its influence across the cosmos, and the diameter of this area ranges from more than 7 to almost 12 astronomical units, where an astronomical unit is roughly the distance from Earth to the Sun, 93 million miles. If you place WOH G64 at the center of our solar system, replacing our yellow dwarf star, it would engulf the orbit of Jupiter, and might even extend to Saturn. Astronomers are kinda uncertain about the exact diameter of the star, which adds to the enigma. The temperature of the red supergiant varies from 4,940 to 5,660 degrees F. It makes WOH G64 one of the coolest stars of its type. Plus, it has a curious variability in its brightness. In other words, the star becomes brighter and dimmer over an 800-day period. This is one of the reasons why it's hard to observe this star. Another reason is a thick dust envelope surrounding it. It's more than one light year in diameter. This cosmic cloud contains three to nine times the sun's mass of expelled material created by the powerful stellar wind. WOH G64 might not be all alone up there. It probably has a dwarf companion. If it turns out to be true, we'll be able to classify the supergiant as a binary star. But so far, this hypothesis hasn't been proven due to the intervening dust clouds, making the study of the star extremely tricky. In any case, being one of the largest and most luminous red supergiants, WOH G64 presents a unique opportunity to study extreme stellar phenomena. Its peculiarities, such as the potential binary nature and that thick cloud of dust enveloping it, 
can contribute to our understanding of stellar evolution and interactions. Just like the features of another ultragiant star, UI Scuti, it has one of the largest diameters among its star family, around 1,700 that of the Sun. If our star was a cherry, UI Scuti would be a 10-story high sphere. But since this supergiant is roughly 9,500 light years away from Earth, give or take a thousand light years, there's a lot of uncertainty in determining its precise diameter. Hop on board. Hurry, we don't have much time. We're on a cosmic journey to find the biggest star in the universe. The first star we pass is our own sun. By far, not the biggest one out there, but it's still massive. You could fit one million Earths inside it. That means if you think of the sun like a basketball, Earth would be half the size of a pencil eraser. If we put all the planets on one side of a scale and the sun on the other, the planets wouldn't stand a chance. The sun makes up 99.9% .9 of all the mass in the entire solar system. Mass is basically how much stuff or matter something is made from. And it's what you can thank for stars shining. You see, the more matter in a star, the thicker and hotter its core becomes. This starts a chain of chemical reactions. Hydrogen atoms get smashed into each other to form helium, releasing an incredible amount of energy. That's the star's light and heat. So, bigger stars also equal brighter ones. But with all those reactions going on, this shortens a star's lifespan. When it starts to run out of fuel, the star will enter the giant phase. It'll expand and turn red. Which brings us back to the task at hand. The biggest star we'll find is likely to be on the edge of its life. Switching on our hyper light engines, we soon arrive at the Lumen 16 system. Here, we'll find one of the smallest stars out there, a brown dwarf. Small here means about the size of Jupiter, but they're small for stars. Brown dwarfs are also called failed stars because they don't have enough mass for those chemical reactions. That means they're not as bright, but they're super dense. All the matter in them is packed together so tightly, they weigh 80 times more than Jupiter, even being the same size. Huh, and if you think that's something, just look at a white dwarf, even more tightly packed. This one here is Sirius B. It's also about the size of Jupiter, but it'd weigh as much as the sun. It emits a dim white light. Once it runs out of gas, it'll turn red and cool down. Now let's fly closer to its giant neighbor, Sirius A. You easily see this star from Earth. No telescope needed. Twice heavier and more than one and a half times wider than our sun, it's the brightest star in our night sky. Now we fly 550 light years away from Earth to the constellation Cassiopeia. Almost a hundred years ago, a cosmic explosion happened here. It expanded the atmosphere of the star Gamma Cassiopeia and some gases were thrown into space. After that, it became the brightest star in the constellation. It's ten times wider than our sun. On to the famous North Star. Funny enough, different stars have had this title over the years, and more will take it in the future. That's because Earth's pole star changes every 26,000 years. Imagine our planet like a spinning top. The northern pole will shift around in a little circle, pointing at different stars to the true north. The current one is a supergiant 37 times wider and 5 times heavier than our sun. It's easy to find in the night sky. It's on the very tip of the Little Dipper's handle. Get ready now. We're setting off for the eye of the storm, the center of our Milky Way galaxy. To see the next star, we need to switch to infrared mode. This pistol star is hiding from us in space dust. In just 20 seconds, it emits as much light as our home star does in an entire year. And its size is jaw-dropping. It's 420 times wider than the sun. But it's still not the most luminous star known to humanity. That would be a blue supergiant in the constellation Triangulum. Meet B416. It's almost 10 million times brighter than the sun. 
but the brighter a star, the faster it burns up all its fuel and the shorter its life. Compared with a red dwarf that barely glows and burns fuel much more slowly, its life will be hundreds of thousands of times shorter. 3,400 light years from Earth, there's one of the rarest celestial bodies in the universe. It's a yellow hypergiant called Rho Cassiopeia. Among the countless stars in our galaxy, there are only a couple dozen of these. And even though this star is extremely far away from our planet, you can still see it in the sky without needing a telescope. That's because it's 300,000 times brighter than our sun. It also helps that the thing is 900 times wider than our home star, too. And its color tells us that its fuel reserves will last for a long time. When Rho Cassiopeia starts to turn red and expand, it'll be one of the biggest stars in the entire universe. Now, we move to the constellation Orion. The star is in our sights. Betelgeuse, one of the largest ones visible to the unaided eye. 700 times the size of our sun, if it took our star's place, its surface would touch the asteroid belt. That's between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars. It would engulf the four inner planets, Earth included. But this star has astronomers very excited. They predict Betelgeuse will explode in a fantastic celestial show in the next 10,000 years. It'll be the greatest astronomical event of all time because we'll be able to observe a supernova at a close but safe enough distance. The exploding star will shine as bright as a half moon. It'll be visible in the daytime sky for a year and at night for several more. Now we venture to stars that exceed the sun's width 1,000 times. Mu Cephei is a hypergiant boasting the title of the reddest known star. Its color tells us that the fuel gauge is getting closer and closer to empty, but it's still so big that it could hold a billion suns in it. And because of its mass, this star will eventually become a supernova or even a black hole. Let's take a trip of almost 4,000 light years from home. Here it is, a red supergiant called VY Canis Majoris. It's one of the biggest and brightest stars of the Milky Way. It could fit 3 billion suns. And even though it's so huge, this thing is surprisingly light, only 17 weights of the sun. In the context of celestial bodies, you could call this star an inflated balloon. In the next 100,000 years, VY Canis Majoris will explode in a hypernova. Gamma radiation will destroy all life in the local part of the universe. But this star is so far from our solar system that it wouldn't mean any harm to us. If we placed MY Cephei in the center of our solar system, it would bulge all the way out to Saturn's orbit. To remind you just how far away Saturn is, think of it this way. It takes the sun's light eight minutes to reach Earth. To get to Saturn, it takes well over an hour. Compared to this massive star, the sun is just a grain of sand. It's one of the most luminous and reddest stars in our universe. The bigger and redder the star, the closer it is to its end. So we're not looking at just a titan of the universe, but also one of the oldest celestial bodies out there. The second biggest star in the universe is UI Scuti. It's about 1.5 billion miles wide, 16 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. This is a pulsating variable star. Its brightness changes about every two years. UI Scuti is a record breaker in fuel combustion per year. Scientists expect it to evolve back to hotter temperatures like a yellow giant. Our journey is coming to an end. Before us, we behold Stevenson 218. It takes 20,000 years for light from this star to reach Earth. It's hard not to see this red supergiant on our tiny terrestrial home. It's 2,150 times wider than our sun. We'd need 10 billion suns to fill its volume. For comparison, the average beach contains only about 5 billion grains of sand. A powerful burst of gamma radiation lasted a mere half second, but it released an enormous amount of energy. It was more than our sun would produce in 10 billion years. This brief flash lit up the whole sky. Afterward, a much softer and more long-lasting glow replaced it. Astronomers examined the phenomenon with X-ray, radio, optical, and infrared waves. It turned out that people had finally seen a newborn magnetar for the first time ever. It was likely formed after two neutron stars had merged, 
It resulted in a kilonova, one of the brightest and largest stellar blasts. Its light finally reached our planet on May 22, 2020. Imagine a massive star, at least five times the mass of our sun, reaching the end of its life. It might be because it's run out of its nuclear fuel. If it happens, the star starts to cool off, the pressure inside drops, and the gravity starts to squeeze inward. And then, more than a million times the mass of our planet collapses within 15 seconds. It happens so fast that an enormous shock wave causes the outer part of the star to blow up. It produces a blinding burst of light. This powerful blast is called a supernova. What's left behind is an incredibly dense core with a huge cloud of hot gas, called a nebula, expanding around it. If the star has been massive enough, more than 10 times the size of the sun, it's likely to turn into a black hole. If not, it turns into a neutron star. It's basically a giant nucleus, the central part of an atom. These stars are mostly made up of neutrons and are rarely larger than 20 miles across. For comparison, our sun is almost 865,000 miles across, which is 109 Earths put side by side. But don't let this relatively tiny size fool you. Any neutron star is at least one and a half times heavier than our sun and has an intense magnetic field. If you scooped just a teaspoon of this star's insides, this matter would weigh more than a billion tons. It's so dense that it makes neutron stars some of the most extreme objects people know about. The next stop is the black hole itself. When two neutron stars merge, they most often create a new, much heavier one. Within milliseconds, or even less, this star collapses into a black hole. But the astronomers who examined the flash of light recorded in March think there might be another outcome. They're almost sure they saw something never observed before the birth of a magnetar. That's a rare form of a neutron star with an ultra-strong magnetic field. It's 1,000 trillion times stronger than our planets. This field is also so powerful, it heats the star's surface up to 18 million degrees Fahrenheit. To put it simply, magnetars are the most powerful magnets in the universe. Their magnetic fields can seriously mess with the neighborhood. Atoms, unlucky enough to get close to such a star, get stretched into pencil-thin lines. If you somehow found yourself several hundred miles away from a magnetar, it would end badly for you. The magnetic field would first disrupt your bioelectricity. It means that your nerve impulses wouldn't work anymore. Even your molecules would change under the influence of the star's field. In the end, you'd pretty much vanish. If a magnetar flew within 100,000 miles from our planet, it would wipe out all the data on every single credit card in the world. When you look at the night sky, it seems like there's not much happening up there and that the stars always twinkle at the same spot. For thousands of years, researchers followed the idea that the lights in the sky were unchanging. Sailors guided their ships using fixed stellar patterns. There are also the exact outlines of constellations we observe today and astronomers identified them a long time ago. It seems impossible that, one day, we wake up and simply can't see some stars anymore. Or does it? A team of researchers at Vanishing and Appearing Sources During a Century of Observations, or VASCO, studied the sky to check how things with the stars are going. The astronomers got the data from Gaia, the European Space Agency, and compared the information from 70 years ago to that from today to see how the sky has changed. To test it right, they had to use both modern and old telescopes. And something really interesting happened up there. Over 700 stars from the old maps were missing. If one star disappears, multiple theories could work. But it's harder when hundreds of them vanished at the same time. Could it be that the data was wrong? or these stars were too faint to detect. Nope, they quickly eliminated this option because these stars had clearly been part of their earlier observations. So, the first thing that comes to mind when talking about how stars disappear is that they reached the point where they ended their lives. You can have the most massive stars of all, and we're talking about those that are way heavier than our sun, and they go through sudden changes as they get to the end which we also call a supernova. 
It's a powerful explosion that later shines for many, many months. And it's still visible, even across hundreds of millions of light years. But that's the point. You see the traces, unlike here. Could this be a failed supernova? That means maybe one of them collapsed but turned into a black hole and consumed the remains from the inside out without causing a powerful explosion. But no one's been mentioning any signs of a black hole being active anywhere near those stars. And what if the stars had become less visible because of dust or gas around them? This is something that can easily happen, as interstellar dust and gas do block our view of objects that are far away. But there were no traces of unusually high concentrations of dust or gas. Nothing destroyed them either. Researchers would have seen traces if something like that had happened. Plus, these missing stars were not all in the same area, which means there probably wasn't just one fatal thing that made them all disappear. Also, the stars were not at the same stage of their life. So it's not an option they were all accidentally close to their end. They weren't particularly old or young, and they were on different levels in size and brightness. At some moments, it even seemed these stars haven't vanished because of some natural events. Maybe it was something related to other civilizations that might be somewhere out there in space. Maybe that's one of the ways to look for them. We could stumble upon some secret civilizations from other planets if we carefully observed the behaviors of stars, especially those we can't explain. No one knows what exactly happened with the missing stars. And unfortunately, right now, all we have are these theories. But you have to admit, they're cool though. Maybe it's just some kind of optical afterglow caused by gamma ray bursts, or maybe even fast radio bursts. Fast radio bursts are powerful pulses of radio waves. They can release more energy in a couple of thousandths of a second than our giant sun does in almost a hundred years. We don't really understand how these energy eruptions work yet, so we don't know what they can do. But still, hundreds of stars at approximately the same time. There are between 100 to 400 billion stars in our galaxy, so we'll probably see some of them disappear too. Hopefully, we'll understand better why such things can happen. Of course, scientists are not sure about this number because we can't see all of the Milky Way stars from our home planet. Some are too faint, some are too far, or even hidden by dust or gas. But they assume these numbers based on the size, shape, and likely mass of the Milky Way. And out of billions of stars, there are a little over 9,000 of them we can see with the naked eye. If you want to see more, you need a good telescope that will reveal those fainter ones your eyes are unable to discern. Many of the stars we see in the night sky are probably not alive anymore. Stars are giant balls of gas that produce light and heat through nuclear fusion in their cores. However, stars also have a limited lifespan, and eventually, they run out of fuel and stop shining. When a star passes, it can either become a white dwarf, neutron star, or black hole, depending on its size. Scientists have discovered that some of the stars we see in the night sky are too old to still be shining. This means that they may have faded, but we are still seeing their light because it takes so long to reach us. Actually, we may be looking at the past when we look up at the stars. Check out all of the stars you can see with your bare eyes. They lie within about 4,000 light years of us. That means what we're seeing are stars that appeared 4,000 years ago. Most of the stars we know of exist within galaxies which are massive collections of stars, gas, and dust held together by gravity. Still, there are large areas of empty space between galaxies too. And the question is, could they have any stars? It seems that these areas of space are not completely empty. There is still some gas and dust, as well as dark matter, which is a type of matter that we cannot see but we know exists because of its gravitational effects on other objects. Scientists have even discovered a few isolated stars in these areas of space. These stars didn't form there. They ended up there by accident, which means they have probably been ejected from their galaxies by gravitational forces or collisions with other objects. 
and there could be more of these stars than we realize, but they are simply too dim to be seen from Earth. Stars don't actually twinkle. It's more that we just see it like that from the Earth. It seems like they twinkle because of the turbulent atmosphere of our planet. The light from a star must pass through many layers of the atmosphere. Not every layer is equally dense, so this causes the light to slightly deflect and change in color and intensity. There's one star named Sirius that sometimes twinkles, sparkles, and flashes so much that some people even tend to report it as something extraterrestrial. This is because Sirius is very bright and is often low on the horizon, which means it experiences more of these special effects of the Earth's atmosphere. When in space, astronomers and astronauts who observe stars from there don't see them twinkling. Hey, want to hear something cool? Me, you, your friends, the rest of humanity, we're all made of stardust. The elements that make up human bodies and all life on Earth were formed inside stars. The building blocks of life, such as carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, were created inside stars and were eventually released into space when the stars were gone. These elements then became part of new stars, planets, and eventually, life on Earth. The iron in our blood was created in the cores of supernovas, which are massive explosions that occur when stars fade. Some say that even the calcium in our teeth and bones is likely to come from exploding stars. The oxygen in our lungs was created in the cores of massive stars before being released into space through supernovas.